Hello, KubeCon and Cloud NativeCon. Hi to everyone. I'm Shweta Bhora. I'm an architect, inventor, blogger, AWS community builder, open source enthusiast, and contributor at time. Before I start with this session, I must say what a phenomenal week this has been. We all have gained, observed, and interacted so much. It's time after today to go back and see and reflect back what we have gained in this amazing KubeCon and CloudNativeCon. Before we go back today, it's time for this session. And it's about you like it or not, you need it, PKI and certificate management. Let's get started. The contents which I'm planning to cover in this session are vocabulary and refresher about PKI and certificate management, vocabulary for those who are new to this topic and refresher for those who are might be aware of, but they might learn a few things new from this. We are also going to talk about a case study, which is common yet complex production case study and a demonstration. And we will be ending with the five PKI design decisions that you must know. Okay, so here we are with the vocabulary and refresher. PKI, public key infrastructure. What is PKI? Let's understand that. Always when you communicate over network, you have two endpoints. This could be client and server. Now, these endpoints talk to each other. Let's say you are, talk, you are using a internet banking or a bank site where you are doing internet banking. And this happens over secure socket layer or transport layer security is required and that protocol is used. What this client and server, how they trust each other and to do, what do they need? There are two things primarily, any endpoint or two endpoints need from each other so that they can smoothly talk to each other. The first one is the trust establishment. Client needs to know that the server I'm talking to, or let's say the bank site I'm talking to is secured enough that I can share my data and information. And once that trust is established, you need to exchange the encrypted data over network. Now this happens day in and out when we interact over network. But what happens behind the scene? How does PKI come in picture? Let's look at that. To have that trust established, your server needs some authorities the first and foremost, the certificate authority, registration authority, and a verification authority. What the server does is that it requests the registration authority to issue an assigned certificate to the server, using which it, it can um, give trust to the client that yes, it has a digital certificate and it communicates encrypted data over network. In turn, registration authority takes that request and takes it to the certificate authority who issues that certificate to you. Now, certificate authority signs that certificate for you and gives you two things. First, it gives back to the server a certificate and a private key. Now, this private key remains with very few entities who need to have hold of that. However, on other hand, certificate authority also gives a certificate plus public key, which can remain anywhere available on the network because it is public. And verification authority keep it with itself and can utilize when needed. Now, what happens when client needs to, or browser, let's say for instance, needs to see that, that this bank site is a valid site and I need to trust on that, then client can request to verify the signature from the verification authority and verification authority replies back saying that signature is okay or not okay. Now, once this whole thing gets established at the back or the behind the scenes, then client uses the encrypted data, or oh, sorry, key, public key to encrypt the data. And on the other hand, server decrypts the data by using the private key. Now, in between there is there is no one who can, possibly there is no one who can uh, uh, decipher that data because public key is available to all, but to decrypt that data, you need that private key. And that's what public key infrastructure provides you. Let's 
And one more thing before I move out of this slide that certificate and DB store, because this whole thing remains somewhere on these servers, which we have seen, and this certificate DB and store gets utilized. So what does PKI provides you? It provides you cryptographic identity to the endpoints. Before I move on, I want to emphasize on that it need not be all the communication over public network. It can be any endpoint. For example, one cluster talking to other cluster, one microservice talking to other microservice. So it, it can be any endpoint and you can utilize PKI for communication over network, be it public or private. So you have to have a cryptographic identity, then you need encryption of data over network so that the data remains secure. How it provides? A PKI provides it by governing issuance and management of digital certificates. And key components, as we have seen in the previous slide, you need digital certificate, you need certificate authority, registration authority, verification authority. Sometimes these three authorities may be same or different, depends on situation to situation. And also you need certificate database or store, which can be referred as needed. So PKI is a framework, not a specific technology. Please keep in mind, it provides you all these things by utilizing certain digital certificates and infrastructure to achieve that. Why moving on? Certainly cryptography, because public and private key difference is something which we want to point out here. And we need to understand what is this cryptography. Cryptography is the sign of secret writing with the intention of keeping your data secret. This cryptography or the algorithms which get used are classified into symmetric or asymmetric cryptography. In symmetric cryptography, what happens? You have a private key which gets utilized for encryption as well as for the, uh, for the decryption of the data. Now the same key needs to be very, very secured and that's why it's called private key encryption or symmetric encryption. On other hand, you have asymmetric cryptography where you have two different keys. One is public and one is secret key or the private key, which remains only with few entities and public keys publicly available. Now symmetric cryptography is simple, so faster, but less secure. However, on other hand, asymmetric is comparatively slower, but tough to break. And there are algorithms like RSA, Diffie-Hellman, ECC algorithm, and many more. Now, PKI uses public key cryptography framework, not the private one. So that's why public key is the name given to the PKI. Moving on. To all this is your gist is the digital certificate. Now let's understand what is a digital certificate. A digital certificate is a digital document that binds the identity to a public key infrastructure. Now, you use it at many places in internet protocol, including TLS, SSL, which is the basis for HTTPS, the secure protocol you use for browsing the web. For example, if you use any browser, you see that there is either a lock comes or a um, open lock also at times come, which shows you that it is secured or not secured. Now, digital certificates you need to generate. How do you generate these? There are many options that are widely available and those uh, options adhere to the international standard, which is X509 standard. Some tools which I'm listing here is OpenSSL, LibreSSL. You have third party RAs and VAs like Let's Encrypt, DigiCert, etc. You have also cloud services these days providing, for example, AWS Certificate Manager, Google Certificate Manager, and the, the, there are many more which provide these digital certificate services. Now, what is the key activities around the digital certificates? Because it's not that you just issue it one time and you can use it forever. It is, there is generation and issuance which is required, distribution, deployment of those or installation of those certificates. That's when these certificates get uh, in use. At times you need to revoke them when there is a um, the certificate gets hacked or due to some changes, you need to pull it back. You also need to renew and rotate these certificates time to time. And last but not the least, 
certificate scanning and monitoring is essential which comes under the digital certificate life cycle management while uh, we are moving let's see some sample certificates this one is from amazon.com it has uh, on the din on the windows it looks like this and you can run uh, cert manager.msc to see on the windows box on command prompt to see this kind of certificate i'm showing a sample certificate for amazon.com where it is issued to amazon.com issued by digicert it has period of validity it has some hashing information associated with that now this is on windows box however on linux box it looks like something like this a text file it has a now again a issuer a subject in this case both c and cn stands for common name common name is same it means it shows that it is for a it is mostly a certificate authority or a root ca it also has public key information as we discussed that public key information is easily available and accessible it also comes bundled at times with your certificate information and the last here which i want to show is that subject key identifier and authority key identifier in this case if you observe this is same however if your certificate is signed by some other authority then these uh, authority key identifier will differ from the subject key identifier so that's how our certificates look like okay what are those files what are those encoding formats and files which uh, certificates come in under x509 certificate there are various encoding formats for example pem pkcs format pem and there are more but pem being uh, the popular one i am showing the files which it produced these green boxes as you see either the dot pem or the dot cert or dot ser file which it produces are the certificates and dot key which it produces is the private key file and it looks like something encrypted data between for example if it is a certificate file then it will be begin certificate and end certificate on other hand if it is a key private key it will be written like begin private key and end private key now how do how does these certificates get generated there is always a request certificate signing request which goes from a server or an end point in a form of dot csr file and this request csr stands for certificate signing request this file looks like begin new certificate request and end new certificate request so by reading this file simply opening that file if you see this understand that this is a certificate signing request this certificate signing request goes to an authority which could be root certificate authority or intermediate certificate authority which we will understand in a moment once this request goes to the certificate authority it signs it digitally signs it you get this certificate and private key file which you need to keep or install at appropriate places to make use of it so before um, we move on to the next topic there is one more important thing for us to understand that there is a hierarchy of certificates root ca to leave certificate and that's called this certificate hierarchy or chain of trust it can be single layer or multi layer cas why we need it we'll talk about it but let's see how does it look like i have pulled a certificate for amazon dot in where you have root ca digital global root g2 which is providing the certificate then you have intermediate ca which gets signed by this root ca intermediate ca then helping you sign with this server certificate so like you have amazon.in amazon.uk amazon.us or what not you can have multiple such server certificates which can be installed on those servers and you can view this hierarchy and that's where the chain of trust or the certificate hierarchy is gets built up for the actual environments or the pki environment while that was about the vocabulary and refresher let's delve into a production common yet complex uh, production scenario that how this how does this pki looks like in actual well in all uh, complex scenarios you have either a corporate data center or a cloud or a cloud to cloud where you need to talk between these entities and serve outside 
also in in all these communications you have a compute layer which could be like your vm ec2s or a serverless compute on other hand you can have a cluster container orchestrator cluster which can be kubernetes and to add to the complexity we we have network layer which helps you talk to all the communication happening over the network between two different entities or sometimes different different domains so this network proxy layer typically contains either an api gateway or elb or ingress gateway and what else you have a service mesh these days we have microservices which are talking to each other so there can be various microservices which which reside in data plane they talk through control plane to your external world and all this gets called at various points by internal users by application and interfaces by external users and there's all the time communication happening between these systems now to make this communication secure what you need you need pki and digital certificates and where all you need you need all these yellow certificates which you see these are some sample places which i am showing for example you need to secure your api gateway you need to secure your load balancers if you are using you need to have microservices having your the those identity um, uh, which is secured then you your ec2s or vms need these certificates your cluster needs certificates and what not even your public websites need these certificates so what we need to do how do we make this secure now let's come to the what infrastructure or what pki framework you need to establish around it so that this becomes a secure network with the digital certificates and communication happening within the encrypted format so first and foremost you need for the external so here i'm calling it external and public ca because for having um, certificate issues and maintain so all your um, ca ra va functionality at times is given by all these uh, uh, various tools uh, or the service providers like GoDaddy, Let's Encrypt, Digicert, and whatnot, um, they provide these root certificate authority, which issues certificates to your websites and other entities which need to interact over internet. Then, typically inside our secured network, we don't rely on these external certificates. So you need another root CA within your secured network. Could be a corporate data center or or it could be a cloud which is your private cloud and that's where you keep a root certificate authority which issues the certificates and it gives the certificates to the prime intermediate cas or subordinate cas also we call so for example ica could be your aws certificate manager where you sign your uh, this particular subordinate CA using this root CA and then AWS certificate manager issues those certificates on your behalf and distributes it to ELB or ingress gateway or whatnot. Similarly, a Kubernetes cluster might need a different IC altogether so that once it gets its identity signed by root CA, then it distributes these the leaf certificates to different applications as per need same is for your service mesh um, there there can be many microservices which keep on coming and going and uh, there's a whole life cycle around those services so you need some subordinate or intermediate ca which issues those certificates to your um, the microservices or the leaf entities or the endpoints so once it is in place what you get you get all these certificates from these CA is signed, installed, and once this is installed, your communication over the network is trusted, identifiable, and encrypted. So um, there is no chance that anybody can creep into your system and reach data and easily can take away your data. So this is what we have seen. You have a public CA, which can be these tools like Digicert, Let's Encrypt and all, which provides and used for external facing website and interfaces. Then you can also have private and intermediate CAs, 
reflected with these uh, symbols in the previous diagram. You can use OpenSSL to issue these cert managers, Piffy Spire, and there could be many other tools. Then you also have these leave certificates, which are the end entities or those digital documents which we've been talking about so far. And these, these are what provide the actual security to your system. Let's see a small demo, which I have already uh, put up in place, but let me quickly show you that how this looks like. Okay, so I am moving to this folder, or let me put it in format, which is clearly visible. Okay, so let's say you have developed a root CA. Now this root CA is a self-signed certificate and a key pair where nobody else signs the root CA. So root CA needs to be uh, much more secured and you get ca.cert and ca.key. I have used root ca.conf to generate these files. There is uh, some configuration. Let's say I'm using OpenSSL, which I have used for this particular case. It needs a lot of configuration. So all the time providing that configuration over command line, I have used it, root ca.con, where I have put all those configuration and I have generated these certificates and keys. Now, once my root CA got generated, I've got my intermediate CA signed by this root CA. So what I did, I got the CSR generated certificate signing request, using which my root CA signed it and provided me with a cert which is my intermediate ca certificate again because it is a, a certificate authority you need a, a configuration a lot of configuration to be provided over the uh, command line so i have encoded it in this file now once these root ca and intermediate cas are ready what i did i start started creating my server certificates or leave certificates so again i need a csr this time my CSR got signed by my intermediate CA and I got my server certificate generated. So this is how it looks like, but in no production case, you will see it in at one place, this is definitely spread it across the authorities and the servers. But let's quickly also look at the format of few of them. For example, let me show you um, open SSL. Give me and I am entering here. Let's say my second, yes. Here I'm giving it um, my root CA and my CA dot cert. Yes. Okay. So this is how my certificate looks like, as we have seen earlier also. My issuer and my subject in this case is same, if you notice, because this is a root CA. And in root CA case only, you should ideally see that your issuer and subject are same because it is self-signed root CA. Then you will also see that you have subject key identifier here and authority key identifier are same, which means that your key here, if you notice, is exactly same. Again, the reason is this is root CA. But if we see this for any other certificate, let's say now I'm opening it for intermediate CA, and where is my cert file? Okay, so this time, interestingly, if you observe here that my issuer is different than my subject. My subject is ICA.demo.com, this common name. And my identifier, subject key identifier, is the newly generated identifier for this particular uh, intermediate CA. But authority key identifier is the one which we saw in the root CA. So that's how the certificates get generated. But what happens when you have your 
Kubernetes cluster and Istio certificates. Would you be generating certificates like this for each and every microservices? Well, that's a lot of work and we cannot do it like that. And that's where let's, let's go back to our presentation where I'm providing you a tool, there can be more, but Spiffy and Spire are coming up really well. Where, uh, let's understand this, Spiffy is secure production identity framework for everyone, which means Spiffy provides you a framework to get those secured identities, and it's a framework. Now, Spire is a production-ready implementation of these Spiffy APIs. So they usually you will see that Spiffy Spire word uh, gets used together. These are both open source uh, graduated projects. Here, Spiffy provides you with the facility like, first of all, you need to register your workloads, identify your nodes and workloads. So registration feature. Then federation, when you have, let's say, two different domains or two different clusters, which is, let's say, one is running on Google, another one is running on AWS or a data center to a cloud, you need to federate those domains. You need to establish trust between those domains, and that's where it provides you with the feature for the federating the clusters or the uh, nodes and domains. Then it also gives you the feature to have your workloads identified and identifiable information given to those workloads, and time to time it provides you the attestation of those um, nodes and workloads. How Spiffy provides it? It provides it by exposing the APIs. It, um, to whom it provides? It provides these uh, features to the actual workload and the nodes. So first thing comes as the node where your workloads run. And these nodes get a Spiffy ID by exchanging a few things from uh, your Spiffy APIs. So this Spiffy identity looks like something like this. Spiffy, where your trust domain name, your namespace, and your SA stands for uh, service account, which it belongs to. So that's how it differentiates that which principle it identifies to. Then you have your workloads. All the workloads running inside your nodes get an identity. So secure, verifiable identity is the name for that, which uh, Spiffy calls it like SVIDs. These SVIDs are nothing but your certificates, X.509 artifacts, which it provides. And how it does that? It does it by having a Spire server and a Spire agent, because remember, Spire is the implementation and Spiffy is the framework of all that API is what it exposes. Now, once that is in place, what happens? As I said, first you get your Spiffy IDs and some selectors along with it. Once that comes, then your workloads get identified. So you need to have certificate signing requ uh, requests. You have to have uh, to get those SVIDs from your, again, Spiffy APIs or the Spire server gets it generated through these a usage of these APIs and you get those nodes give CSR and gets SVIDs and Spiffy bundles, which never leaves the node. So you have this information comes up to the node and nodes time to time uh, distribute it and gives it to the various workloads. Now, it doesn't matter workload go down or up and keeps coming. You have your secure, verifiable identities. And on top of that, um, you need not worry about renewal, let's say, or the rotation of those certificates. It it gets taken care by Spiffy and Spire um, the, through the field. All right. So let's talk about five PKI design decisions that you must know. First and foremost, you should know how to design your certificate chain or hierarchy. It can be a single root CA authority where single root signs the, your uh, ICAs and other certificates and takes that ownership. It can also be multiple intermediate CAs to protect your uh, root CA. You can also have a, a subordinate CA or ICA which you are delegating to and this in turn signs the other size ICAs uh, certificate signing requests. Other way of doing it in complex systems that you have a geographical or departmental or domain distribution where it is segregated ICAs at geography level. It can be segregated ICAs at um, your department or domain level, which in turn take care of your leave certificates, distribution and certificate lifecycle management. But 
to keep in mind that wise thing is to keep uh, design your certificate hierarchy based on size of your organization criticality levels of security required and operational capacity you have because ultimately more the hierarchy more the burden you have second point where to terminate your certificates by termination we mean that um, let's say if you're terminating your certificate at api gateway then which means that beyond this point your data would be traversing it will be decrypted at this layer and data will be traversing in plain text so it will not be end to end encryption but encryption will end here in most cases where it it can be used that uh, terminate it at api gateway load balancer or ingress controller layer which means the network proxy layers or in other cases uh, you might want to end it at compute computation layer which means at the vms or ec2s or at the pod containers now this depends on that um, how much of compliance how much of uh, data in transit do you have a requirement of end to end encryption requirements then yes it makes sense to do it at compute layer but in other cases to keep it simple because it comes up with a um, lot of computation and performance requirements as well as the operational needs to maintain those certificates which you generate so it's better that you uh, end at network proxy layer because ultimately it then routes it to your internal secure network but look at your requirements and then design that what uh, is your requirement specifically third thing to keep in mind the tls version mismatches so at times we have uh, tls 1.2 to 1.3 or tls versus mtls need to coexist um, for example, in this instance, if you have to coexist with TLS and a mutual TLS, where TLS is one-way trust verification, and on the other hand, MTLS is two-way trust um, handshake. So sometimes you need to have both coexist. For example, in your in case of Istio Service Mesh, it automatically configures your workload containers or sidecars to use mutual tls when calling other workloads so how would you coexist with these variations so in such cases know the ways to exist for example use mtls mode for peer authentication modes can be like strict permissive or disable where strict is that strictly you have to have mutual tls to mutual tls communication permissive could be that it is optional it can be relaxed and disable can be that you can totally disable mutual tls and keep it um, simple so that's about the third point now fourth an important point that certificate revocation methods and design so there are ways to revoke um, revoke your certificates and keep a list of it because when you do the revocation you also need to inform various uh, entities or verification authorities that yes these certificates have been revoked so how do you do that simplest way of doing is that keep a certificate revocation list whenever you are revoking a certificate and this can be automated or manual process where you keep checking whether any certificate is revoked and take action appropriately either manual or automatic another way of doing it in online certificate status protocol where web browsers keep a tab on that what certificates are um, revoked and they they change i mean whenever they get to know about this revocation of certificates they maintain that list and they renew the cert get the new certificates from these cas the the upward version of ocsp is ocsp stepling where browse web browsers get this information rather than asking from cas get it steppled whenever they, there is a tls handshake happening now why it is relevant because crl crl design is often overlooked aspect of pki design so you should know how to design it. recommendation is for internal private cas use crl to keep it simple and use customer automation but in public cas when there is facility of such protocols then definitely you must use of that fifth point certificate automation and monitoring again many a times unplanned uh, area and uh, to you need to keep a balance uh, about what and how much to automate in operations few suggestions create certificate templates to keep it same within your organization and always adhere to certain policies and configuration utilize certificates rolling deployment to avoid downtime during certification renewal or expiry you can use tools like spiffy and spire 
You can also use tools for monitoring, tracing, and alerting for better and easy certificate management. For example, Grafana gives you a nice little dashboard of certificate when it is about to expire or when it is already expired. Um, Istio Kiali gives you this animation, little beautiful animation where it tells you that which all communication is secured through TLS and certificates and which is not. So have your own mechanism, but uh, tools can be any, but utilize these tools for automating, monitoring and alerting. Yes, we have reached to the end. We have a lot we have covered. Uh, thanks for listening patiently. It's time for questions and please do leave your feedback by scanning this QR code. Thank you so much.